Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. I was supposed to do a product review, but my girlfriend was over and she saw that I have this broken power supply and she wanted to help me repair it. So I thought that we would do uh, this repair video first before I do uh, that big review that I'm working on. So we decided to take a look at this. This is a high voltage power supply made by a Japanese company called Matsusada. I believe that's how you pronounce it. And this is a 600 volt, 1.6 amp power supply. So it's almost a kilowatt. And it's uh, quite dangerous, as you know, 600 volts at 1.6 amp can be quite deadly. And uh, this is not working, non-functional. I picked it up from eBay, eBay a short while ago. I paid about maybe just over $100 for it, uh, so not so much. And uh, it does not uh, produce any output that was high was described. I actually haven't turned it on, and I'll tell you why. Because it has a, a smell coming out of it, and it doesn't actually smell burnt. It smells quite bad. It smells... Uh, almost like manure I would say and it's a very classic smell of a leaked uh, electrolytic capacitor so it could be that this has several dead capacitors and as you can see this is a very short profile power supply designed to be inside a rack many of them stacked up so these things uh, actually do experience quite high thermal effects so uh, failure of that type of capacitor is quite common. Now this is a, as I said, I believe a Japanese company, so the, the quality of the components should be good. So I'm interested to see if that has happened. So my guess before opening it up is that that is what's going on. I'm also going to flip it over so you, you can see what's going on at the back. And then uh, my girlfriend will take it apart, take a look and see uh, if my guess is right. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not going to turn it on because if it does indeed have bad capacitors and bad components, turning it on can not, not only be dangerous but also can just cause more damage. So let's flip it over and see what it looks like on the other side. And here's the back of the unit. So I, I, I let my girlfriend also smell to this vent and she disagrees. She doesn't think it smells like manure. She, th she thinks it smells like a car what? Vent. A car vent. I, I have to disagree. We're going to have to wait until smell vision is invented before we can uh, part with uh, one of us here. So uh, it, this is the back of the unit. Here's where the AC line will come in. And here's the main terminal for the output of the power supply. And again, as I said, quite dangerous. And even if you're working on this and you turn it off and you disconnect everything, still touching this could be dangerous because you may be charged up and so on, depending on the architecture and how bleeding resistors are implemented or not, whether it has safety discharge. But you can clearly see that almost the entire thermal profile of this unit has to be handled from these two vents because it has no other way of actually getting rid of the air. There is a little bit of holes on each side, on the side over here, but I, I'm pretty sure that this is... Uh, the main area it has to exchange air from and this is a problem with these low profile ones but you can you know stack 20 of these in a row and i'm not sure if you notice but in the front and the back there are some stickers this says cathode on it so this tells me that this unit was used somewhere for you know powering some high cathode uh, tubes and so on this must have been one of the voltages for one of the terminals so i'm pretty excited to take it apart here and uh, we're gonna open it up and see what it looks like on the inside we expect to see a lot of really low profile components such as transformers and capacitors and so on specifically designed to fit in, in this uh, in this space and again this is a Japanese uh, company and a Japanese manufactured part I believe so I, I think it should be a, a you know good quality and I expect fairly nice design in it so yeah, in fact it is it says right here made in Japan so indeed it is so let's go ahead and take it apart and see what we see all right and here's the instrument with the top removed it's covered of course completely in plastic and that's not surprising it's of course going to have to provide some level of isolation between all the electronics and the top cover which is metallic uh, but there is a little bit more to it than that because these pieces of plastic are also responsible for directing airflow and for cooling a unit the fan is right over here and it's a blower essentially it's going to suck air from all around here and blow it through this path down these heat sinks and out back of this unit so there's actually a little path here that a piece of plastic is, uh, is, is intended to guide the airflow through these heat sinks. So it's no surprise um, that um, this has to be designed like this because the thermal profile is quite difficult to meet. Now I'm not sure if the air comes this way and then it goes out or it goes that way and then out. I would probably suspect that the air is sucked in this way so it goes over the heat sinks first. Now as I said there's indeed some capacitor problems and you can see some discoloration here on the plastic and if we Go ahead and peel this back partially. You might, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it or not, but this capacitor has a big bulge on top of it. So this is an output cap and certainly it has died. And these two caps over here, which I'm not sure exactly for which part of the circuit that they're supposed to be on, but they also seem to have leaked and there's residue of it here and it's getting all over uh, my finger here. So uh, I have to take this piece of plastic off in order for us to be able to get a clear look of it. But on first glance, it looks okay. I see some exposed wires, which I'm not happy about. 
but the individual section of the power supply are quite recognizable, separated by the main input, uh, the main output, and the digital circuitry in these three segments. So pretty interesting, as I said, lots of low, low profile transformers as to be expected from a switching power supply like this. This obviously steps up the voltage quite a bit because it has to go to 600 and it works from 110 volt here in the United States. So uh, let's, let me go ahead and, and remove this and these are all glued down. Not really the most elegant solution. It would be nice if this piece of plastic was perhaps a little bit harder and had nice uh, pegs and little stands they would be uh, screwed onto here. I would have been much more happy with this and this kind of this type of design. But anyhow, let's see uh, what it looks like if we explore a little bit more. So here's the first layer of plastic removed and now the airflow becomes even more clear. You can see that these pieces of plastic actually fold down over here to create a path which, which had, where the air has to flow um, in that path. And this piece of plastic here is actually screwed directly to, the, to this turbine style fan here, which either I think it should probably blow air this way and then you can clearly see the path. So I can see already one failed cap here, one here and one here and surprisingly a non-electrolytic one seems to have completely leaked out here as well. All of these, and this is of course unplugged, so don't panic if you see my cat's head. <laughs> no, no, nothing is plugged or ever been plugged in actually. And uh, you can see that um, this, this whole piece obviously is the output. Now I'm a little bit surprised for a couple of reasons. Uh, these are, I'm pretty sure they must be Japanese brand capacitors. There you go, yeah, they're Nishikon brand, which is an excellent brand of course. And uh, what I'm surprised to find is that these are 85 degrees Celsius rated. I'm surprised to find these caps be only 85 degrees Celsius on, on such a high, an expensive Japanese made power supply when they're directly in the flow of the uh, hot air. So no wonder they've died. They, this must have been in a very hot environment with many units on top of each other and they have eventually thermally given up. Now this one doesn't look like it has failed. These are 400 volt, 330 microfarad capacitors. I suspect they're in series because the output can go up to 600. I have to take a look and these are obviously also Yep, 400 volts, and these are 33 microfarad ones. So even though this is alive, I would I would switch them. Now, um, usually when I buy these type of capacitors, I buy them at 105 degrees Celsius for this type of repair because I want to make sure that they have the the highest temperature that I can find. In fact, interestingly enough, these caps right here, these ones that are on the main input, these are 1,000 volts. Uh, th sorry, 1,000 microfarad, 200 volts. These are 105 degrees Celsius rated, but this is not. I don't know why they have. Uh, cheaped out on this and put on 85 degrees Celsius. I'm disappointed by that. So we're going to have to go ahead and replace both of these and this and that and take a close look and make sure nothing else is damaged. Of course, even if you replace this, it doesn't mean that it's going to come back to life, but it is a, uh, a pretty good chance that it might. I can see some shunt wires here, most likely current sensing uh, shunt uh, wires here, kind of uh, surprising. These are all high thermal uh, resistance, high dielectric breakdown wires, but you can see that they've become exposed here. Uh, this doesn't fully uh, cover them. Either this has come out or they've just left it like this. Again, I don't really like that. I would have preferred to have seen them covered up a little bit better. So I'm going to cover them uh, while I'm going to repair it. But check out the input filtering. One ceramic fuse over here. Common mode inductor, absolutely massive. And a whole bunch of uh, capacitors here around the input. Very nice, a lot of protections, a lot of MOFs. Uh, looks quite nice on the input side on the high voltage power supply, the high voltage line coming in and of course all the switching transistors are all over here and the main two transformers uh, for the switching converter out here and these must be all the digital circuitry because it's the digital interface all the way back here. So interesting design here with different modules that are covered up, some board just uh, added on top over here, perhaps some for um, something that they've custom made or they change between different models because this has different models that you can purchase. An expansion board here which is not populated. Interesting again. And of course the potentiometers in the front for adjusting the, uh, the voltage and the current. So, so far looks good. And it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to take apart, but uh, we're going to go ahead and try. And it looks like that in order for me to take, to replace these capacitors, luckily all the capacitors are on the output board here, so I should be able to replace this and all of these actually are on one board, so they all have to come out together. So we're going to be Quite a bit of disassembly going on. I'm going to take some pictures of it to make sure that we can put it back together exactly like this, but let's go ahead and uh, replace some caps. And here's the entire output board. You can see obviously a modular design. The filled capacitors can be seen here and the output terminals uh, over here. And we've disconnected the minimum number of things that we could have uh, gotten rid of in order to take it out of the chassis itself. And at the back of it, you can clearly see the, the classic technique of having uh, having solder uh, 
uh, layers be double doubling the traces that are on the PCB to increase the current handling capability as well as uh, improving the uh, lowering the resistance. Interestingly enough, you can see that they've blocked out some areas where the screw terminals all are in order to make a, a better contact so that you're not relying on the soft solder here and also uh, have a better gold plated connection here that doesn't oxidize. So nice design at the back. Uh, nothing to really complain. The whole thing is kind of put together by hand. It doesn't have that kind of nice pieces being fit together very nicely. It's a little bit of a hack job, I, I feel, and the whole power supply. But perhaps this is uh, fairly normal for uh, this type of uh, low volume production things where they make them one at a time. But I would have liked to see a little bit of a better design. Otherwise, I cannot really find anything uh, wrong with it. So now we're going to go ahead and try and remove these caps, which is going to be a bit of a challenge uh, because there's quite a bit of thermal mass here where the capacitors are, so it should be interesting uh, to see how that works out. And uh, we can go ahead and see what we can do. And these are these are the two uh, plus and minus output uh, paths there. So uh, let's see. Yeah, let's go one step at a time. Maybe start with the smaller capacitors there, remove them, replace them uh, with something that I found, and we'll move from there. All right, after a lot of hard work, and uh, we managed to get all of this out and I have you know that my girlfriend only cried four times while trying to get these components out. I'm just kidding. So um, here you go, these are the original ones. Uh, you can see that uh, 330 microfarad, 400 volts and this is 85 degrees Celsius rated. And here is my replacement, same brand but a different class, the GW class and this is 100 and, oops, 105 degrees Celsius rated. So definitely an upgrade to the existing one, exactly the same footprint, exactly the same dimension. So that's going to be a, a nice replacement, definitely an upgrade over what's, what's in, already inside the unit. And here's the other ones, uh, 400 volts, 33 microfarad. These ones are 105 degrees Celsius rated and I'm replacing them with, again, same, same brand, but 33 microfarad, 400 volts, but if you can see, 125 degrees Celsius rated, so also an improvement over the existing caps that are there. Uh, these ones, uh, I think all of these cost maybe about $20. I can't remember, I have to check out bottom from DigiKey. And here's the other capacitor, simple, uh, this is a 473, and I'm replacing it with an identical value uh, capacitor there, 43 nanofarad, so 47 nanofarad. So pretty straightforward, and uh, this uh, is also rated for uh, 400 volts, similar to the other one, so we should be able to go and consider damage here. Everything has oozed out of this uh, unit, either thermally or because of a cascade failure. I'm not exactly sure what is going on, but most likely this is a similar problem, thermal problem. So now we're gonna go ahead and get rid of these uh, old ones and solder the new ones in there, and then we'll have a brand new uh, thing to try and put it all back together, and then we can turn it on for the first time very carefully. I uh, like to put all the case and everything back on and all the plastic covers back on before we turn it on also because we need the, the thermal pad uh, to be properly adequately put back together. So let's go. And here we are. Not bad. Everything replaced. Two brand new caps here and here. And here's the uh, non-electrolytic one that's being replaced. And at the back it looks just like before. I just have to do a, a little bit of cleaning over here from the residue of the flux that's left. It was a pretty straightforward job. Now I'm not sure if there's anything else wrong with it, but the only, there's only one way to really find out is to put it back together, turn it on uh, carefully and see what happens if there is actually a, indeed an output. Again, very, very carefully working with high voltage power supplies or any power supply with exposed lines from the wall, extremely careful, never take it lightly. So we're going to go close it up and turn it on and then I have a couple of interesting experiments in mind if it works uh, to, to show you. So let's see. Well, how about that? I bet you weren't expecting this disaster. If you can't figure it out already, I have taken it completely apart. So what happened is that we put it back together, turned it on, everything was fine, but it was producing no output at all. So I figured, oh, okay, probably what's gone wrong is that when these capacitors initially died, they created a short, and that must have blown a fuse because it must have been overloaded uh, the DC DC converters and so on. And I said, okay, that's fine. Let's let's go ahead and check all the fuses. And now that's exactly what we ended up doing. Uh, this thing has one fuse here, one fuse here, and one fuse here. Obviously, this fuse was okay because the screen lights up and the numbers all show up and everything. And this fuse is clear. You can see it's fine. Then I measured this fuse here. And indeed, that fuse was dead. And it was uh, this one right here. It's actually rated 15 amps. So I said, okay, that's great. Then we're going to change the fuse and everything should be fine. Change the fuse put the new fuse back on, plug it in, turn it on, 
and the resistors exploded. So at that point, uh, well, we gave up, went out for a drink, and then uh, came back and uh, I took it completely apart. Now I'm actually here by myself now. And uh, you can see that uh, this resistor indeed has, uh, has died and it completely uh, burned out and it cracked and a piece of it uh, fell out, which is this piece over here. So something was still um, overheating. Now the reason the fuse uh, didn't die this time is because I didn't have a, a, a fast acting fuse and I actually put a slow acting fuse in this place just to get things going and as you can see that that's clearly not a good idea this is an example of what would happen by the time the slow acting fuse had a chance to respond the resistor had already exploded and of course this is very very dangerous it's not plugged in of course anymore but uh, anyhow so I said okay well it's time to do some more debugging now luckily if you look at this uh, from the back you can clearly see very quickly uh, what that fuse is doing now given that this thing does turn on and I do get a signal uh, I do get a display and I get voltages for the display and the microprocessor and all that it seems to be working therefore that some part of this is definitely alive now if you look that fuse from this side of the circuit connects this pin to this pin now this pin is sitting on this big huge plane which is all the plane of all the capacitors and are all on that and those capacitors are indeed holding charge so there is definitely voltage present here but as soon as this node is connected to this node I get the blown out fuse now the blown out uh, resistor and this resistor actually in series with the AC line in some way I haven't carefully examined it but clearly they are in the path of the power coming into the unit so if I were to follow this line I can see that this line branches into two and then it connects to this pin over here and this pin over here and a couple of other things which I don't think are as important and these thick lines obviously are the points of interest because they are the ones designed to carry quite a bit of current now if I go over here and I look well it's no surprise that those lines lead to these cables and these cables are connected to transistors so it is likely that one of these transistors has mo likely died and that is causing a short circuit where that fuse uh, connection normally would be so what I have to do is I'm gonna have to go and measure these transistors and see if all the transistors are actually uh, open and the way I know there are transistors well you know they have three pins and they're uh, on the DC DC path and well they're actually labeled Q which is even uh, easier to figure out now I cannot see what the part number of those devices are because they're all attached to heatsink as you can see but it should still be possible to figure out something now the two that are connected to our fuse over here is the one over this pin and this pin and if I flip it out that would be these two and it looks out that would mean it's these two devices so these are the suspect devices that are connected to that fuse pad and I would like to find out if they are dead or not so let's go ahead and see uh, do some probing see if we can figure something out alright I went ahead and I took the devices off the heatsink and you're not gonna believe this look they have sawed off or uh, scratched off the part number of these devices so I can't know what they've used I I've never seen I mean I've seen a lot of times where people scratch off the part number of an IC but I've never seen anyone do that to something that's clearly has to be a transistor I mean the PCB labels them as as a, I don't know if you can see or not sorry um, let's see the PCB labels them as Q so they have to be transistors I mean how many how many options could there be for these devices, they have to be, I mean, they most likely are MOSFETs, I would, I would think. Ah, oh, man, I am, uh, I gotta say, I'm shocked to find that. So now we have to think a little bit more, figure out uh, what they are. Well, the fact that the suspect uh, wires are these two, so these are the suspect devices, because you can see, and I, again, I, you can kind of tell, and this thinner line has got to be the gate, um, because the thicker line one very thick line which covers this entire path is connected to this pin over here and that pin runs with a thick line on the other side to the wire as well this really wide line so that has to be that configuration now we can do some relative measurements between these devices to see what we get but man I gotta say I was not <laughs> expecting this very interesting and here's the board after it's been removed 
from the main power supply PCB and uh, of course as you can see that, that there's the four transistors that we were dealing with and I went ahead and, and I followed the traces and it became very uh, quickly evident that this is just a full H bridge that's driving the main core of the transformer, the main the fundamental coil of the transformer and so we have four transistors, transistor 1, 2, 3 and 4 in this, in this uh, orientation, 1, 2, 3 and 4 so indeed uh, we have this configuration now Normally, H bridges are made with complementary devices, N NMOS transistors and PMOS transistors, but that may not necessarily be the case depending on the current handling capability and how the gates of the H bridge are driven. They may not have complementary devices. One of the reasons you may not want to use complementary devices is because PMOS transistors on resistance is typically uh, quite a bit higher due to mobility uh, differences between the carriers. So that means that sometimes they use uh, NMOS devices and there's other challenges if you use an NMOS device in the high side there are other limitations but it may be very well worth it, uh, worth it for a high power application not to do that so uh, it actually turns out that uh, we should be able to go ahead and find out whether uh, how these are configured whether they are NMOS or PMOS by measuring them we can measure their IV characteristic or we can measure the internal diode that's inside these um, transistors naturally now we know the gate is on pin 1 so let's go ahead and do some measurements on all of them and compare them and see what happens so let's go ahead and measure these devices now before I do that I just wanted to give you an update on the Siglin SDM 3055A which I reviewed before now this instrument now has a new firmware which uh, was uh, based on uh, my review and they uh, went ahead and they significantly improved the update rate of the screen which was one of the main complaints I had about it and everybody else as well so you can see how much faster the screen actually updates now this is in the slow mode and if I go to the fast mode then it's even even much 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 quicker and this is a huge uh, improvement over what we were dealing with uh, before so I'm quite happy uh, to say that that problem uh, at least for the most part has been uh, become quite a, quite a bit uh, less significant so let's go to the ohms measurement here and of course if I, I short this we're going to go to zero so let's go ahead and measure uh, from the gate to the other terminals now I expect to see a high impedance uh, almost a high impedance from the gate to the other other uh, terminals and yes indeed you can see that we don't have anything and between the drain and the source there you go we have about 28 mega ohm which is totally normal for a device like this and we're going to go ahead and measure this one too again all completely open between the drain and the source 26 mega ohm so these two devices are identical uh, in, in, their per, in their way they respond between the three terminals which is great now let's go to the other one and I measure from the gate to the drain and look at that zero so the gate is shorted to the drain of this device which of course is a catastrophic failure now to the drain also a short circuit and between the drain and the source also a short circuit so this device is definitely dead and that would be sufficient to short our main um, DC DC converter which would be pretty bad and then this one oh, also dead exactly the same problem completely catastrophic failure of this device between all of its terminals so this is promising in a way because these two are good and these two are bad and if you look at the schematic that I drew before those happen to be complementary devices so I actually am measuring 1 and 2 so 1 and 2 are good and 3 and 4 are bad and since we don't know whether um, 2 and 4 are PMOS or NMOS this is going to be very helpful because we can compare 1 and 2 together and that makes it pretty straightforward to find out what device we're dealing with so let's go ahead and put this to a measuring diode all right so let's go ahead and try and measure the diode that's inside these devices so let's go with the good device and measure between the drain and the source in this orientation and you can see that we see nothing this is open which is perfect and let's go ahead and try this one yep also an open and obviously we know that these are dead so there's no point in measuring them let's flip this one over and now we should be able to measure the diode that's between the drain and the source and there it is and you can see it has a forward junction voltage of 0.4 volts perfect and you can see how much faster the instrument is now uh, let's go ahead and measure this one and you can see that it also says 0.4 volts this tells me without having to measure the full IV characteristic that these are the same devices because if these were a PMOS one was an NMOS and one was a PMOS then the diode would have been reversed in its orientation so it's likely that uh, these are both the same I actually did go ahead and measure the IV characteristic separately and indeed it looks they both look like NMOSs so that's that's perfect so now I went ahead and I ordered let me see if I can grab this here my box of components 
Here we go. And uh, so one of the very first thing I bought is I bought the resistors that I destroyed basically years ago. There's, oops. There's four of these. This is a classic uh, ceramic encased. Uh, uh, resistors are 47 ohms just like the ones that are on the board so we're going to go ahead and replace those so that that will take care of that I also purchased some transistors which are right here there we go I bought four of these and they are the exact same package and uh, you, there you go you can see the, the part number right here in case you're curious these are 500 volts uh, 23 amp uh, devices and I believe the R on resistance of them is quite small it's less than 0.1 ohm uh, which is perfect so I should be able to actually go ahead and measure in exactly the same way uh, the junction voltage here I'm going to put it here sorry it's going to be right out of your view and we can go ahead and measure the diode and if I can get this connection made there we go, there it is. You see, you can see that it does exactly uh, the same thing between the same uh, terminals. So that's fantastic and we're gonna go ahead and uh, put these now. I bought four of these and there are four, even though these two are okay, but I'm gonna replace all four because I wanna keep the circuit completely balanced with matched devices because these are likely not the same ones that are on there and then you would have a semi-balanced uh, H bridge which is uh, not good. So we're gonna make all of them to be the same. So there's a little bit of soldering required now, taking these off, putting the resistors on and take it one step at a time. Here we go, all reassembled and put back together. So here are the new devices connected back to the heatsink, the cables all soldered back up. So it looks uh, good, looks like it was just like before. And uh, I also have the broken resistor here, you can see that now that the case has cracked, you can actually see uh, what's inside of the wire bound uh, type of resistor there. So the other ones are kind of have cracks on them or they're discolored so I just changed all four of them and the four new ones are right here so so far so good now we have to put it all back together in the chassis unfortunately it's not very safe to turn it on unless everything is put back together the way it's supposed to be because to be honest I, I'll talk about it at the end uh, when, no matter what happens is I don't really like the way this is engineered at least not mechanically but anyway so let's go put it back together all right, here we go. I've put everything back together, but I have not installed the fuse yet. So it's basically like before, it's still open circuit where those, uh, where the bad devices uh, used to be, but everything is back together the way it was. And I haven't installed all the plastic on it. We should be okay, at least for this stage. So I just want to make sure that it is back to where it was before in terms of its operation. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. And indeed, it does do exactly that. But you can see that if I go ahead and enable the output, I get zero volts, even though uh, let's say I'm going to set it to, you know, it's set to 138 volts, 0.22 amps. When, when I let go, even though the output is enabled, you see that I get nothing, which makes sense because everything's turned off. Now, let me show you something interesting, which highlights how dangerous an instrument like this actually is, especially when it's not working completely. So I'm going to go turn it off like that. And I'm going to go ahead and unplug it from the wall. Here we go. So here's the plug, but check it out. Look, it runs for a good couple of seconds when it's unplugged because of all the charge that's stored in these devices. And this hopefully is a good indication of how dangerous something like this actually is, especially when it's broken. Because when this is open, there's no charge, there's no, uh, nothing is driving the transformer when the output is disabled and all the charge is still there and you can actually run everything for a couple of seconds, even though it was unplugged. So please be extra, extra careful when dealing uh, with something like this. So let's go ahead and install the, uh, the, um, the fuse in there and see what happens. Ah oh boy, guess what? It still doesn't work and you can see my cat's utter disappointment with the outcome. So it turns out that uh, I put the fuse back on, it was perfectly fine, the fuse survives, the resistor survives, everything looks great, And uh, but it, the circuit still does not produce an output. So I went ahead and I looked at the gate voltages that are part of the H bridge. So the gate voltages are obviously have to be in some sort of a switching sequence in order to drive the transformer and ultimately you know, get a DC to C transformer like that to work. But it turns out that the gate voltages are driven from a module that used to be here. And that's this module, this was here, I just removed it. And this module is directly connected to these gates. So, so whatever is in here is driving these H bridge transistors. But I removed it and check it out. It's all potted, it's all closed up. 
you cannot know what's in it and uh, it's impossible to open this if you ever dealt with this and this is just uh, it's just too frustrating I hate this power supply because of all the precautions they've taken so that no one can replicate the design and no one can repair it and so on it has all these custom modules here's another one over here which is just a complete mystery here's one in here and there's a whole bunch of other one on the rest of the board and I, I can't really repair it in any meaningful way I don't have the schematic I have no information at all other than everything that I've reversed engineered and of course this is really literally a brick wall now in, in sense of how much further I can go back so I'm sorry that I can't bring it back to life I don't have that much more time to spend on it but I think it was still very interesting playing around with it and showing you what's inside it and uh, still debugging it all the way step by step to, to a point where we no longer can go backwards unfortunately because everything is really a mystery at this point but in case you happen to have the schematic of this or you happen to know what's going on with it uh, what's inside here and so on and like you can figure this out from experience that you may have had with this power supply you know let me know I can try it again I, I'll keep it I won't throw it away I'm a little bit disappointed that Matsuwara's uh, marketing and design strategies are going to lead some nice power supply like this to be unusable now at least uh, I'm not able to fix it at this point anymore but who knows maybe we can figure something out in the future uh, so I'll keep it but nonetheless I hope you enjoyed the video let me know what you think I always read, uh, enjoy reading your comments and uh, your engagement with the videos is, is very nice. So, until next time.